The word immortal means to live forever, something or someone that never dies. In pro wrestling, there's no such thing as forever. Every career, every reign, every magical story eventually sees an end, but sometimes there's a performer that creates a legacy that so far exceeds the concept of time. Something that, no matter how much wrestling changes, no matter who follows them, their legacy only grows with time. The Undertaker's WrestleMania run is just that. Death, taxes, and The Undertaker winning at WrestleMania. It was as simple as that. 21 times Undertaker walked into WrestleMania, and 21 times he left the event with a win. What was an accident and something that went undetected turned into a spectacle within the spectacle of WrestleMania. In the 90s, it was just a string of matches. Slowly, they became about championships and standalone rivalries, but as the years wore on, Undertaker left the show of shows without a blemish on his name. The streak took on a life of its own. It became an event. It became Undertaker's yearly thrill ride. It became WrestleMania. The streak in the later years aged like fine wine, giving us classics between Undertaker and Shawn Michaels, Triple H, CM Punk, and Edge. But before the streak was even a thing, it was all about WrestleMania. It all began as an idea by by Vince McMahon. There's a beauty to how Undertaker was able to help propel WrestleMania into the events it became. Even though he wasn't supposed to be on the marquee, he was. All these years later, the wrestling world still talks about his timeless collection of matches, rivalries, iconic entrances, and reinventions. Timeless and iconic. WrestleMania and Undertaker. Two words that will forever go hand in hand. On paper, a zombie mortician as a character shouldn't be taken seriously. It shouldn't be a main eventer. On paper, the character of The Undertaker would have been dead a few years after its arrival, not taken seriously and reduced to nothing more than a comedy act. But this wasn't on paper. This was the beginning of a legacy of a man many considered the greatest WWE superstar of all time, and the man behind it just had to be Mark Calloway. It was Survivor Series 1990 and The Undertaker made his debut and nothing was ever the same. With him, he carried a mystique unlike any other. He was able to bring fear into children's eyes and from the very moment he arrived, started to write his story of immortality, running through jobbers and mid-carters with Paul Bearer by his side. And just a few months later, history would be written. At WrestleMania 7, The Undertaker competed at that event for the very first time. His opponent was Jimmy Superfly Snuka in a nothing match. A 5 minute run time with Snuka eating the pin to a 25 year old just starting to find his footing. On the surface, it was just one match out of 14 on the card, but here the legend of the streak was born and it was born on the same day as the person who plays The Undertaker, perfectly starting on his birthday. The show was about to change forever. See, Vince McMahon created the concept in 1985, building it around the rock and wrestling connection as well as Hulk Hogan. In its early years, Hogan was the guy for WrestleMania. The impact he had on the show is a topic of its own, but even though he was the man that the concept was launched around, the real cornerstone was going to be The Undertaker. By sheer virtue of work, this run was about to organic capture a magic that will never be seen again. The following year, he took on another veteran in Jake the Snake Roberts, who he beat after hitting a tombstone pile driver on the outside of the ring before making the cover after rolling him back in. Bret Hart has gone on record to say that Roberts sabotaged this match because he refused to make Taker look good. Hart thought that the spot should have taken place in the ring, to which Roberts said that he thought that calling an audible was the better move because it made storyline sense and looked just as brutal. In the end, Undertaker still got the pin over him. Important to remember that Roberts was on his way to WCW, so it was just an extended squash match. Nonetheless, Two wins, zero losses for The Undertaker at the show of shows. This was followed by one of the worst WrestleMania matches of all time against Giant Gonzalez. Gonzalez had entered the Royal Rumble illegally and eliminated Taker from the match. So that brought us here. Taker won by DQ and this was the only match in his WrestleMania run that he won by DQ. Gonzalez ended up using a chloroform soaked rag. He wouldn't compete at the event in 1994 because of injury. He returned the next year to beat King Kong Bundy where Taker having not lost at WrestleMania was mentioned for the first time while he was making his entrance. He was now 4-0 at the event and probably without the company even realizing it. Undertaker was a spectacle who was there for the over the top theatrics of professional wrestling rather than a guy who was there to put on classics. 
Up until this point, there wasn't anything major for him, no big feuds, but as the times changed, so did that. At Mania 12, it was Diesel versus Undertaker. These two had been feuding for a bit. Diesel cost Taker the WWE title against Bret Hart, and then Taker cost Diesel a title shot of his own before dispatching of him at WrestleMania. Another win for Taker before Diesel headed off to WCW. Beat Psycho Sid for the WWF Championship in his first WrestleMania main event. And again, up until now, nothing's really worthwhile. No crazy matches, the rivalries aren't anything to write home about, but WrestleMania 14 was different. It was Bad Blood 1997, just a normal October day WWF pay-per-view, but on that night, the world witnessed the first ever Hell in a Cell match between HBK and The Undertaker. But this match, as historic as it was, is remembered for the debut of Kane, who came out, ripped the cell door off with his bare hands, proceeding to hit the tombstone on Undertaker, costing him the win. The tombstone, of course, no one had ever kicked out of. Come the following year, HBK and Undertaker continued their feud, this time in a casket match, where Kane interfered again, helping Sean get the win. And after this, Kane locked Undertaker in a casket and set it on fire. The match for WrestleMania 14 was on. It was Undertaker against his storyline brother Kane, two supernatural forces, and for many, the debut of Kane warranted a win here. Kane kicked out of two tombstone pile drivers, and it took a third for Taker to get the win and improve his record to 7-0. By late 98, Undertaker was firmly established as one of the top talents in the company, and as the company started to grow, Undertaker had to start changing up his acts. He became the leader of the Ministry of Darkness, and he faced Big Boss Man at WrestleMania 15 in what's considered one of the worst Hell in a Cell matches of all time. Before this disaster happened, there was this monstrosity, which was capped off with Undertaker hanging Boss Man from a noose. The previous two Hell in a Cell matches had been so barbaric, so hardcore, but this one failed to meet that same standard. In 01, it was time for Undertaker to play the game in the first of three meetings between the two at WrestleMania. The story was pretty simple. Triple H had said that he's beaten everyone and Undertaker took exception to that. Maybe a little bit too much because he and Kane held Stephanie hostage until he got his match. I briefly mentioned Evolutions, you'd seen early Undertaker, Ministry of Darkness Undertaker. Well, in 2001, we got the first Mania appearance of the American Badass Undertaker. See, the evolutions of a character in pro wrestling are so important. Keeping things fresh, preventing your character from getting stale, and always adapting is something that's truly needed for a long career. For his legacy at WrestleMania, he's always done that, and that's what made his run so special. Through the years, you saw various adaptations. It wasn't just the same old, same old. You saw the supernatural version, you saw him have vulnerability as time went on, and here you saw a natural version of him. Undertaker himself said that this was done for more range as the times were changing. Taker in a 2022 interview said, You got Stone Cold who's cutting these incredible promos that people can really identify with. It's like real life with a little bit of gas behind it. You got The Rock cutting these unbelievable promos. All these promos are just so good. So according to The Undertaker, the dark character wouldn't have worked with the times. He changed from an unrealistic supernatural character to basically an authentic version of who he truly was. A motorcycle riding, ass kicking, badass. This allowed for him to have a better connection with the audience, obviously talk more while cutting promos cause trash talk had become popular at this time. He basically used his creative genius to see that in a world full of these new ultra realistic characters that he might be left behind. In his match with Triple H at WrestleMania X7, he was the face and this was a really fun brawl with a ton of power moves and near falls near the end of the match. Another Undertaker win. Weirdly enough, Vince McMahon forgot to put both Undertaker and Triple H on this card until the last minute where JR reminded him. Thankfully he did cause it just added another great match to what's considered the greatest WrestleMania of all time. Triple H of course, a huge fan of the Nature Boy Ric Flair and that was Taker's next victim in the streak. The year previous, Rick had told Triple H that he wanted to face Undertaker. Taker had the choice between RVD or Flair for Mania 18. He chose Flair because of his legacy and very quickly when Vince presented him his options. This one revolved around Undertaker wanting a match with Flair. Flair saying no, so Taker took matters into his own hands, beat up Arn Anderson and Rick's son David. Undertaker made his entrance to Limp Biscuits rolling. This was a no DQ match and pretty old school with how they ramped up the intensity of the match. Bloody, but as always, you know the result. 10 and 0. There he was with every finger out, signifying his dominance at the event. Everything was happening organically. Every year there was a new chapter written without the streak being forced cause it wasn't fully a thing yet. 
On this match, Ric Flair said that he was horrified that he would let down the company comparing this match to the Super Bowl and the NBA championship. He said that he had to pull off his end of the bargain and he said, quote, I was mortified. It really speaks to the pressure that even the biggest legends in the industry had while facing Undertaker at WrestleMania. The 19th installment was supposed to feature a tag match between Nathan Jones and Undertaker against A-Train and Big Show, but because Nathan Jones just wasn't good enough to put in that high profile match at the time, they changed it to Taker fighting both Show and A-Train in a handicap match. That, of course, he won. At Survivor Series 03, Undertaker lost a Buried Alive match to Vince McMahon after interference from Kane. This was the end of the big evil persona and the dead man was reincarnated at the following year's WrestleMania. At Mania 20, Undertaker beat Kane to give him a dozen total victories. And going through everything now, this is where things really started to take off. The streak became the prize to contend for, and perfectly the cinematic production that was the streak began in Hollywood. So up until this point, it was usually either a random match, a rivalry that bled into a Mania match with the record being secondary, but come 2005, that changed. The streak took on a life of its own, and it became this whole segment of WrestleMania, almost like a video game. Titles were in the rearview mirror, this was all about who would beat the dead man and become the first blemish on his resume, and in turn, become immortal. Whoever the challenger was versus the final boss of sports entertainment's biggest event, and the next challenger was none other than Randy Orton. 24 years old, the biggest douchebag in the WWE, killing legends, killing women, RKOing his own girlfriend. It didn't matter. The future was right in front of our eyes. And now it was time for the legend killer to meet the legend of all legends on his home turf. This was originally supposed to be Undertaker and Kane versus Snitsky and Heidenreich while Randy Orton took on Triple H. That didn't happen because Randy worked better as a heel so Batista slotted in for him. At just 24, Orton was offered the chance to break the streak. Thing was, he got in his own way, being late to the Mania rehearsal which Orton said nobody considered himself more of an asshole for doing what he did than him because the night before he was out partying. Nonetheless, when the match happened, rehearsal or not, we got the first true great match in the Undertaker's WrestleMania catalog. The time when Taker's matches started to hit a little different. These two went counter for counter with the most memorable one being when Orton turned a chokeslam into an RKO but ultimately met the same fate as the previous 12 men before him. Though it started at WrestleMania 27, this was the night. This was where it became the ultimate story. It became a talking point every year. Who's next? Well, it was Mark Henry, but it almost wasn't. Taker asked Vince a whole four months before Mania if he could face Kurt Angle. Undertaker wanted a match in his resume that was five stars because up until that point, he didn't have a WrestleMania match that was that good. He even considered having Angle be the guy to break the streak, but Vince shot down that idea to which Angle later said he agreed. Before Mania, their match at No Way Out 06 was great and is considered one of the best from that year. It was eventually Mark Henry in a casket match who was another person considered to end the streak, but wasn't asked about it fully. Taker got the win, and now this was a different beast. The streak was being pushed hard, but Taker wanted to work with the new generation. Here's where the stories, the matches, and the intensity was really ramped up. In 2007, Undertaker won the Royal Rumble, last eliminating Shawn Michaels, who we'll get to in a bit, and now the choice was his. He chose the World Heavyweight Champion Batista, and the story was the classic Can They Coexist, a match built on respect, then disrespect when Batista said he didn't fear the dead man. I don't want to say Undertaker had finally figured it out, but here he was amazing in the ring. Rather than big dead guy with a cool gimmick, he added great performances to his repertoire. It's funny because there were so many nothing matches early on, but here the dynamic changed. These two right from the start went all out and skipped the feeling out process in a match that many believe was the best from WrestleMania 23. Undertaker won the World Heavyweight Championship and he's talked about this match saying that since Batista didn't go out in main event, he had a chip on his shoulder. The chip that was on Undertaker's shoulder though was the World Heavyweight Championship. Just like at WrestleMania 24 where at the end of it he beat Edge to bring his record to 16-0 in another great match. 
This time he was in the main event and he won the world title for the last time in his WrestleMania career. Edge was another guy who was asked to break the streak but refused because he had too much respect for it. These two had feuded for almost a year and it could have been a huge decision but it only made the streak bigger. Look where we were now. Of the 24 WrestleManias that had taken place, 16 had seen the dead man appear. Every year a new victim, every year a new story. But as important as his legacy is and as important as his rivalries are, I think I'd be remiss to talk about the streak and not talk about the legendary entrances that we got. The moment that gong hit our WrestleMania, every year it was cinematic, sending chills up your spine. Very few experiences in professional wrestling compared to his entrance. Sure, you had great stories leading in, but when The Undertaker made his presence felt, it changed the whole dynamic. The purple smoke, the fire, the caskets, the druids, the dead clawing at his feet made for some of the most legendary visuals in the company's history. He was able to change the atmosphere with his walk and made it feel like, again, an event of its own. For as much as an entrance may be taken for granted, on a yearly basis, he made it part of the performance. But here we are, the run. The run where the streak took on a life of its own. Undertaker at this point had reduced his workload. He wasn't around much in the WWE, so when WrestleMania season came along, the premier storyline oftentimes, especially in the final five years of the streak, became something otherworldly. The performances became more robust, the referee's hand had so much weight every time it hit the mat, and the stories seemed to get better every year. The movie kicked off in Hollywood, well the best part may be when Shawn Michaels entered the scene. Shawn and Taker 11 years previous had backstage beef because Taker was tired of Shawn messing around with the WWF's business and apparently before HBK's match with Stone Cold at Mania 14 showed him the fist that if he didn't put over Austin he'd face the the consequences. Of course, the screw job had happened months before that. Nonetheless, Sean lost that match, but in reality, he was really lost. An addiction to painkillers and a back injury caused him to miss four years. By 2002, HBK found God and overcame his drug habit. What was supposed to be a one match run turned into an amazing second prime, but thing was, he was a raw guy while Taker was on SmackDown. Their paths never crossed. The only two left from the original Monday Night Raw episode during that time met in 2007 as the final two in the Royal Rumble, having a great mini match which Undertaker ended up winning. The next year, the last two were the first two to start off the Rumble. By the time 2009 came around, Sean was a different man. He and Undertaker were the backstage leaders of the locker room and they faced off at WrestleMania 25 and my words, don't do justice to the performance that these two men put on. Some saying it's the greatest WrestleMania match of all time, others purely crowning it the greatest WWE match of all time. In the home state of both HBK and Undertaker, it was the battle of light and dark. The story coming in was that Sean wasn't afraid of Undertaker, saying that it was time for the streak to rest in peace. Sean was mocking Taker with his own druids coming out dressed in white, saying that they both represent darkness and light, that they've gone down different roads, but they're both very different, but very similar. Sean said that it was going to be the funeral of the streak. When we got to that night, Sean descended from the heavens while the Undertaker rises from the ground in black representing dark and hell. The entrances added so much to what was about to be a spectacular match. Both men pacing this out perfectly. Every moment amplified from the dive to the kick out to the near fall to the end where even Mr. WrestleMania couldn't get the job done against the phenom of WrestleMania. A masterclass in telling a story and properly topping it off with a perfect match. Undertaker was still undefeated, 17 and 0. This match had rave reviews and it took home the Slammy for WWE Match of the Year in 2009 where Sean said that he could beat The Undertaker. That loss was consuming him because he was just so close. At every turn, he was denied though. He couldn't win the Rumble. Undertaker flat out said no, so Sean took matters into his own hands. While Undertaker was defending his world title, Sean cost him it all, thinking that it would reward him. But what he thought would be the ultimate prize would be the ultimate price to pay. Undertaker would put up his 17-0 streak, but only if Sean put his entire career on the line. It was labeled just that, streak versus career. The main event of WrestleMania 26, these two went out there and again tore the house down. Whether or not you believe it's better than the original is up to you, but at the end of it, it was heartbreak for the heartbreak kid. 
his career was over. Michaels talked about the pressure of Mania, saying that they felt like they needed to top WrestleMania 25. Quote, it was very much an issue, very much talked about. I feel like we both felt that streak versus career stipulation obviously helped. We had at least gotten to the point in our careers where you worry about that topping factor, but you don't quite apply the same pressure to yourself that you did when you were younger. We had some different dynamics to the story. If all that is fresh, then technically the only thing that will be the same are the two guys. You have to do your best to rationalize it as best as you can because the big pink elephant in the room is can you follow it? Undertaker later called his WrestleMania 25 match against Shawn Michaels his favorite match and said it was as close to perfect as possible. The storytelling coupled with great matches is really what put this over the top. The ability to bring you into it, having a guy consumed by a loss, putting everything on the line. Oddly enough, this wasn't supposed to happen. It was going to be Drew McIntyre versus The Undertaker, but he wasn't ready at this point. This was a two year story that actually went on for two more and in turn turned to a four year period of consistently building a story to a huge climax, but not without some speculation before that. Let's talk about dream matches. Dream matches in WrestleMania, the perfect stage for them to happen. Some deliver, some miss, some remain just a fantasy as is Sting versus The Undertaker. Two supernatural forces and wrestling greats never meeting in a WWE ring. Sting himself said that he declined this match alongside an induction to the Hall of Fame, citing the track record of former WCW guys before him. WWE had put out these cryptic vignettes that showed a man walking into a cabin with a trench coat on, which led to fan speculation that Sting was on his way to the WWE as he didn't have a contract with TNA. This was also fueled by a New York Daily News report that stated that Sting had signed a one-year WWE contract according to King Jordan. That though was not the case. Instead, it was another meeting with Triple H. Triple H came out and these two looked at the sign and it was on. The underlying story here was the relationship between Shawn Michaels and Triple H. Best friends in and outside of the ring. Triple H told Shawn to tell Taker that he was going to be the one to end the streak. And a conflicted Michaels couldn't do it because in his heart of hearts, he knew that if he couldn't do it, Triple H couldn't as well. And when we got to WrestleMania 27, which is one of the worst WrestleManias of all time, this no holds barred match was basically the only saving grace of the show, both guys beating each other into a pulp with well timed spots, more different than the match Undertaker had at WrestleMania 25 and 26, this one was more of a brawl. Come the end of the match, even though Taker was the winner, Triple H was the first back to his feet as Taker got checked on by refs and EMTs and was carted out of the arena, which Vince McMahon absolutely hated because he wanted his monster to walk out on his own two feet. The story then came to an end, with the perfectly named end of an era Hell in a Cell match. Normally it was wrestlers challenging The Undertaker, this time it was Undertaker making the challenge. Because of what had happened the year previous and how he got carried out of the arena, he had a metaphorical loss, he wanted to avenge that, so he gave Triple H another chance to end the streak while he got his retribution. Shawn Michaels was added into this match as a special guest referee. The question was where would his allegiance lie? with his best friend or with the man he respects and the same man who ended his career. On a card with the highly anticipated matchup of John Cena and The Rock, this one was another thriller in Taker's resume with the closest streak bump you'll ever see. But in the end, it didn't matter. Undertaker won and all three men left the ring together showing their mutual respect. More layers to The Undertaker. This showed vulnerability. I can't stress this point enough, just how important it is to have different dynamics in a run like this. How hard it is to capture what had been happening up until this point. The matches were hitting, the stakes were high, and the legend grew even bigger. In 2013, Undertaker met CM Punk. For those unfamiliar, Punk had just come off a 434 day WWE title run. He only really lost the title so that the company could do Rock Cena 2 for the WWE title after it was a box office success the previous year. Now without a championship, WWE gave him the next best option to take on the streak. Much like Batista, he went out there with a chip on his shoulder and made magic in another well received Undertaker match with the dead man bringing his record to 21-0. CM Punk was upset that he didn't main event because he felt like he deserved it. When Chris Jericho told him that he basically was in the main event, Punk didn't have any of it. This would really be the final spectacular in-ring Undertaker match at WrestleMania. As unfathomable as it was, 
We were just under a year away from seeing the unthinkable happen, and little did we know, people had gotten comfortable with the possibility of Taker's career ending with the streak intact. It almost sounded like a myth, this otherworldly character who, no matter the opponent, did not lose at WrestleMania. The next year, it was WrestleMania 30. 30 years of sports entertainment's biggest spectacle, Undertaker had a huge hand in that. His opponent was Brock Lesnar, already legitimized. It felt like a given that the streak would see 22-0. After magic from WrestleMania 23-29, to it almost felt like a refresh period for the streak. And that brought us here. It was April 6, 2014, Undertaker vs Brock Lesnar, a pretty nothing match where the fans were just waiting for Undertaker to overcome Brock Lesnar and move on to the main event in a not so good match. However, when Chad Patton's hand slapped the mat for three, everything became unfathomable. How? Undertaker had lost at WrestleMania, surely not this story, surely this had to be a mistake. A stunned stadium, millions around the world confused at the sight. When Brock Lesnar was in the UFC, Alistair Overeem finished him with a gut punch in one of his fights. It was almost fitting that he delivered his own gut shot to the entire wrestling world by pinning Undertaker 1-2-3 and ending the streak. A moment where time stood still and no one will ever forget where they were. It was a 3 second count, but the moments afterwards felt like an eternity. In a world where so much is scripted and predictable, the moment just reinforced the point that anything could happen at any given moment. As the graphic appeared over the head of The Undertaker, it confirmed the unthinkable, 21 and 1. Undertaker had lost at WrestleMania, the place where no one could sniff him. The dead man's streak was laid to rest. The day of, Vince McMahon decided to kill off the streak thinking that Taker didn't have many matches left. So the sooner the better and the most credible person to do so was Brock Lesnar. The decision was made last minute. Undertaker got concussed early on into this match and Brock had to, for lack of a better term, carry the match. Undertaker said that he doesn't remember anything from 3.30pm the day of WrestleMania until 4am the next day. He doesn't remember the stadium's reaction for maybe the biggest defeat in WWE history. His wife Michelle McCool said that he was so concussed that he had no idea of his own name. When he went to the hospital, Vince and Brock went with him. But back to the aftermath of this match for a second. When Undertaker pulled himself up bruised and battered, it looked like he was walking away. The years of build, the blood, sweat and tears he had given the company to make WrestleMania what it was, was over. Perfectly, this was ending at the 30 year mark, where WrestleMania had grown to epic proportions. It was all over. All the storylines, all the challengers that came before, all those 21 victims didn't compare to the one blemish of Brock Lesnar. You saw something die that you never thought would. Time stood still, and it's a moment that, again, every fan remembers where they were. You saw a visual that you never in your wildest dreams imagined. When you least expected it, when you thought you were safe, they hit you with this. Maybe the craziest moment in WWE history, jaws on the floor, it gave you emotions. The decision to end the streak has been questioned by a lot of people. Even The Undertaker has said that he didn't think Brock needed it, but he respected Vince's decision. Instead, Undertaker would have liked someone who would have benefited from the win a lot more. Randy Orton and Shawn Michaels have also said that this isn't how the story should have gone. It's a double-sided debate, as most things are in the WWE. On one side, you have this iconic, mythical man who never lost at the event, and the argument is how do you capture something like this again without it being forced? It was so organic, the stories, the matches, the years and years of build was all washed away that this should have followed Undertaker literally to the grave. All of it was over. The matches and moments were essentially killed off. Undertaker left WrestleMania looking old, in pain, looking like he was in fact human, and it looked like the night the streak died would be the swan song for the dead man at the show. But it wasn't.
The concussion led to an internal battle of demons for Undertaker. He didn't think he could compete at a high level anymore, but Triple H told him to remember who the hell he was. So he wrestled Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania 31, giving us a battle between two supernatural forces, one nearing the end of his career, the other just starting to find his way in that same role. Undertaker won that match, and from here it became a string of appearances with the streak already over. 2016's installment saw Undertaker take on Shane McMahon, in which if Shane won, he'd get full control of Raw, a loss for Taker would prevent him from competing at WrestleMania ever again. At that show, the match is most remembered for Shane jumping from the top of the Hell in a Cell to his demise below. He was back in Texas, this time it was a different performance than the one he had against Michaels. The match quality started to go down, the storytelling sometimes random without the streak behind it. Fan sentiment also reinforced the point that people cared more about The Undertaker's health than him showing up at WrestleMania. It was a 180 at that point, Undertaker's matches had become the premier matches for a long while now. Following Mania 29, he just wasn't the same performer we'd come to see year in and year out. Father Time had caught up to him and rather than leave it all behind and ride off on his high horse, he kept coming back for more with the dead man looking sick, defeated, and not the phenom of days gone by. This only got reinforced when the company was putting all their chips behind Roman Reigns and these two went out and main evented WrestleMania 33, with Undertaker looking like a shell of the performer he once was. A pretty sad encounter that saw Roman get the win and following the match, Undertaker appeared to say his goodbye putting his iconic hat, gloves, and trench coat in the center of the ring and walking up the ramp to give one final salute. On a night that was labeled the ultimate thrill ride, it looked like this was the Phenom's last ride, putting over the next generation superstar and leaving his yard with a new chief in charge. Undertaker said he was, quote, so disgusted with his match at WrestleMania 33, and that disgust just kept him coming back for more to get closure. Of course, Roman Reigns was being presented as the new guy, but before him, the guy was John Cena, and an Undertaker-Cena match was something that fans had wanted for a long time. Unfortunately, it happened when both performers were past their prime. Instead of being presented as the battle of two of WWE's greatest, this was instead portrayed as Cena not being able to make it to WrestleMania and almost made it feel like he called out The Undertaker because there was no other option left. Their match at WrestleMania 34 went just under three minutes. Undertaker has said in interviews that he prepared for it to go 30 to 45, but he was told it was going short. When you get so high, the only place to go is down, and the performances were doing just that. When the streak ended, it was almost like WrestleMania was never the same. Neither was The Undertaker. In 2019, he missed WrestleMania, which was the first time in 18 years he hadn't appeared. The finale came in 2020 against AJ Styles. With the pandemic not making a live WrestleMania possible, the company instead shifted gears to a cinematic boneyard match where Undertaker brought back the American Badass. He got the win, and this was a blessing in disguise since this wasn't a traditional wrestling match, it helped Undertaker mask up his in-ring deficiencies. And with that, his WrestleMania story saw the final chapter written. I started off this video talking about the word immortal, how people come and go but sometimes the legacy that that person leaves behind grows to an unfathomable high. Undertaker defined WrestleMania for nearly 30 years. Now Undertaker is retired from the WWE, he's taken his rightful place in the Hall of Fame, 25 wins at WrestleMania. That's such a high bar to get to, rarely does a performer even make it to WrestleMania 10 to 15 times, little less compete on the event 27 times. Mark Calloway made an indelible mark on the business that won't be matched again, with layers upon layers of storytelling. He worked with multiple generations, he gave back to the next generation and many times on his own accord asked for the streak to be broken. For 30 years, Undertaker gave everything to the WWE, and in turn, the fans put him on this pedestal that he so truly belongs on. The legacy of the streak, however, is a happy accident that grew into a tale that's going to be told for years. A man who captured the imagination of millions, gained respect, put on some of the biggest stories in not only WrestleMania history, but company history. The night that the streak died is where WrestleMania stopped feeling the same for a generation that grew up with The Undertaker. Undertaker continually defied the odds, defied his age, and proved to an entire fan base how special records like these are. Hard to make, 
even harder to keep and impossible to replicate. Undertaker carried WrestleMania on his back and through his privacy and respect for the business made his matches must see. The streak sold tickets. The Undertaker made WrestleMania with drama, suspense, and class. As amazing as his undefeated run was, his entire WrestleMania run in retrospect is something that'll probably never be matched again. When you dig into the story behind each growing number up until 21, you see the challenges, pressure, and the heart that came with each of them. When you dig into what happened afterwards, you see the story of someone who just wanted to prove himself even more because he knew how good he was. WrestleMania simply became Undertaker's stomping ground. There's a huge difference between just appearing on a show and wrestling to being the guy who's able to capture the imagination of millions and on a yearly basis put in the work. To The Undertaker, the streak was everything. To WrestleMania, the streak was pivotal in the show's rise to prominence. To WWE, the streak is the greatest run a superstar will ever see. And to the fans, the streak is a generational catalog of rivalries, matches, and moments that will never be seen again. The streak to WrestleMania was simply everything.